people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Yeah, definitely. I don't think, from what I've heard from her, from my interviews, uh, it's just me. It's all me at the moment, you know. I'm the one pushing for the fights. I'm the one asking for them. I'm the one calling them out. They don't want They don't want that kind of, you know, she's trying to head in a different direction. She's moved up to 140. She says she's she will move back down to 135 for the Katie Taylor or maybe uh, Alicia Van Gardner. But from what I've seen and what I've what she's coming across as, that's the only fights that will motivate her to to come back down to one forty five. So I just feel like she's you know she's trying to head in a different direction. So I don't see that happening, unfortunately, anytime soon. But anything can happen. Maybe I'll jump up to one forty and chase it from from there. So if if there's a, a belt that comes available, you know, if Chantel v- vacates a belt, I would love to jump up. Me and Michaela could fight for that. That'd be cool. Is Olympic amateur standout from the United Kingdom, Carolyn Dubois, still in hot pursuit of a Michaela Mayer fight. Michaela, who doesn't want to give her the time of day, Michaela, who very recently stated she's going to make a pit stop at 140. She's going to move up from 135 up to 140 to top out at 147. Keep busy fight this year at 140. Then she means to have a bigger fight, presumably a Natasha Jonas fight at 147. That's just my best guess. That's what I think she's shooting for. But she ain't got no time for young Carolyn Dubois. Carolyn Dubois, who debuted as a professional last year and has fought seven times since then. I understand Carolyn's ambition, her desire to face one of the somebodies at or around these weights. But remember that this is a fighter that debuted last year and she's only 22 years old. She's only got seven fights in the bank. Little over a year's time in the pro ranks. Whereas Michaela Mayer is a lot more seasoned, having debuted as a professional way back there in 2017 she's been in the pro ranks for six years something like 18 and 19 pro fights i mean you know what kind of fights she's looking for and you could hardly blame her for that understanding carolyn dubois ambition to square off against one of the bigger names one of the somebodies at or around these weights i get it but i also feel that they're rushing her a bit that that's not necessarily a fight that she needs right now at 22 years old what they ought to do is conjure up some familiar face some familiar opponents, opponents that have shared the ring with the Michaela Mayers and the Katie Taylors and Alicia Baumgartners. I mean, if you can't get the big names, the next best thing is to fight the fighters, some of them, fight the fighters that some of the big names have fought to create that conversation. Who did it better? Go in there with some of the girls that Katie Taylor has fought. Go in there with some of the girls that Michaela Mayer, Alicia Baumgartner, some of those girls. Go in there with some of the girls that Chantel Cameron has fought. If you can't get the big names that would be the next best thing yeah. while still amassing professional experience because Carolyn needs it. Yeah. She's only been in the pro ranks for a little over a year. She should be looking to fight fighters like former WBA champion Ana E. S. De Sanchez or Anisha Bashil, two fighters that Chantel Cameron fought a few years ago. Yamila Esther Reynoso, who shared the ring with Amanda Serrano at 140, or maybe Lucy Wildhart, who just shared the ring with Michaela Mayer, the fighter that Carolyn is after. She should be looking to fight the fighters that the familiar faces have fought in order to build her own name, build her own brand, because unless there's some money attached to a Dubois fight, or a belt, big names aren't gonna fight her. They're not gonna fight her for no reason. They're not. No belt, no money, no fight. And it really is as simple as that. It is. But because Carolyn Dubois has such a fan-friendly style, because she's a knockout merchant, a violent one, a spiteful southpaw with real stopping power, all I've got to do is keep putting her on undercards. Keep putting her on undercards for boxer shows. Keep racking up those highlight reel knockouts. Keep putting on those show-stopping performances, and the rest will sort itself out. The idea that she's going to follow Michaela Mayer up to 140, 147, that's a fruitless endeavor. Until there's some money attached to the fight, it don't go down. Do what Eddie Hearn did with Katie Taylor. Make it a point 
to stick Carolyn Dubois on the undercards of your biggest shows the way Eddie Hearn did with Katie Taylor on Anthony Joshua's shows. You know, at the start, that's how he got the ball rolling. He'd have Katie Taylor on Anthony Joshua's undercards, knowing she would get maximum exposure in him doing so. Do that with Carolyn. And if you're doing that already, then just keep doing it. She's only been a pro for a year and a half. It's the idea that a fighter with under 10 fights and under two years in the pro game is going to be fast-tracked to a mayor fight, that's just not realistic. Look at how long it took Alicia Baumgartner to corner a fight like that. Something like five years as a professional with 12 or 13 fights. Gotta crawl before you walk. As stated, in the absence of a belt or a big purse, I just don't see the fight happening. So Carolyn just needs to stay busy, stay active, stay sharp, and the big fights will come. Men's super middleweight news, David Benavidez believes he is too big and too strong for Demetrius Andre. Rumor has it these two are supposed to be locking horns with each other in the fall, and I do like the fight. The rumor has it it's going to be billed as a pay-per-view, and neither one of these two have all that much drawing power. Earlier this year, the current WBC interim champion faced his first elite opponent in Caleb Plant. Having banked that win, Benavidez is now on the verge of marching straight into another big-time matchup. According to Mike Kopinger of ESPN, Benavidez is simply crossing his T's and dotting his I's as negotiations between himself and Demetrius Andre continue to move in the right direction. Although the former two-division champion has presented his opponents with bemusing tricks and crafty angles, Benavidez believes he's seen the likes of Andre before. There are similarities between Caleb Plant's methodology and Demetrius Andre's. You could definitely argue that the Caleb Plant fight was good preparation for this one. There are definitely similarities between the two. two They're defensively two, minded two. fighters, both Caleb and Demetrius. They tend to lean more towards finesse than ferocity. They're not artillery fighters. They're not fighters that look to win their fights through strength of arms. These are sweet science guys. These are craftsmen, cerebral fighters, outside fighters. I feel like he's the same type of fighter, said Benavidez to BoxingScene.com when asked, asked to compare Andre to Caleb Plant. It isn't every day that Andre finds himself involved in one of the biggest fights of the year. For much of his career, the former Olympian believes he's been avoided. Perpetual call-outs of Canelo Alvarez, Gennady Golovkin, and Jermall Charlo didn't amount to anything. So reluctantly, Andre took on who was available. Although it led to world reigns in two separate divisions, Andre's level of opposition has been chastised left and right. Those criticisms, however, will be a thing of the past if he lines up against Benavidez. Those criticisms are warranted because, well, you could make the argument that Andre was avoided to some degree, he did some avoiding of his own for many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jermall should have fought Demetrius, but Demetrius should have fought Jermall back when they were both at 154. He pulled out of that fight. He pulled out of the Matt Vekarabov fight. Never got around to fighting Lara. Never got around to fighting Sergei Divyanchenko or Yannibek Alamkanalai or Zach Parker. It's a two-way street. Likely to be viewed as the favorite heading in, David Benavidez isn't sleeping on the undefeated former champion and will be standing across the ring from him. His respect level for what Andre brings to the table has always been at an all-time high. With that said, there were parallels to the impending clash between them and his showdown with Plant. Ultimately, well, he expects Andre to give him one hell of a fight. Benavidez predicts a second-half offensive avalanche. I feel like I'm just too strong. Once we get to the mid-rounds, I took over, and I see the same thing happening in this fight. There are parallels to be drawn between Demetrius Andre and Caleb Plant. Caleb like Demetrius, Demetrius like Caleb, they both get off to decent starts at the beginning of a match, but as the later rounds roll around, they start to fade, the both of them, both Caleb and Demetrius. It's not uncommon to see Demetrius go out there and get off to a fast start, going as far as scoring a knockdown. He's good for a knockdown at the beginning of the match, but not necessarily good for a knockout. He's not a knockout merchant. Demetrius like Caleb gets off to a decent start, but slows down down as the fight progresses at 36 years old 36 year old legs earlier this year it was reported that david benavidez would be taking on david morell in the fall that quickly turned into demetrius andre why demetrius and not david why not
not David Morrell. It's likely because David Morrell is a puncher, whereas Demetrius Andre is not. David Morrell is a young fighter, younger than Demetrius, whereas Demetrius, he is in his mid-30s. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying, there's a reason they ended up with Demetrius instead of David Morrell. Would have been okay with either fight, I'm just wrapping my mind around the matchmaking, the preference, why Demetrius and not David Morrell, and it's likely because David Morrell, he is a puncher, he is a young fighter, ambitious, whereas Demetrius, he's in his mid 30s and he's not a puncher for the risks they'd be taking on with david morrell who can really crack they're not going to get that much out of it doesn't have much if any name value and in truth neither does demetrius but demetrius is a more accomplished fighter with many more rounds in the bank than david morrell so in terms of credit and trying to get credit i do think they'd get more credit for beating unbeaten demetrius andre than unbeaten david morrell should better win the similarities between demetrius andre's methodology and Caleb Plants. Both those guys are pure boxers. Economic, outside jabbers, defensively minded guys, yeah. movers. They're both pure boxers. They have their subtle differences. They have their differences. But in terms of base styles, both Demetrius and Caleb are pure boxers. And because David just fought Caleb, he figures that this fight is going to be very similar to that fight. That Demetrius starts off all right, just like Caleb, but he fades down the stretch, just like Caleb. So as long as you keep the pressure on him and force him to work round by round, eventually he's going to gas out and you can tear him up. That's what he figures. Differences between Demetrius and Caleb, even though they possess a very similar base style, is that... Where Caleb Plant had been stopped before, ahead of the Benavidez fight, Demetrius has never been stopped. No. Nope. He's never been beat. The differences between Caleb and Demetrius is that Demetrius Andre is a southpaw. Caleb Plant is an orthodox fighter. Demetrius Andre is a southpaw. A long and limber southpaw, albeit one in his mid-30s. David's got the right style for the job. If you want to get to a pure boxer, you've got to throw punches in bunches and apply pressure. Cut the ring off and force the pure boxer to work. Make them uncomfortable comfortable and make them fight your fight what you gotta do tactical advantage that volume punchers and pressure fighters have over pure boxers is the pace they set for a match oftentimes is more than the pure boxer can handle more than they can deal with even if they start off all right they end up gassing out we saw in the rashidi ellis versus roman villa fight or the shavkat rakamov versus zelfa barrett fight they end up gassing out Demetrius andre regularly gasses out in fights that he's dominating fights that he's actually winning what happens when you put him in there with a big young guy like a David Benavidez? So I see the hierarchy of thought. I see the logic. Irrespective of who wins, the winner of the fight for the winner of the fight, this would be the biggest win of their career. Either a signature win for David or a signature win for Demetrius, who sorely needs one. 36 years old, having campaigned at three weights and been a champion in two, he has no memorable moments, no signature fights. This would be the first. I like the matchmaking. But for Demetrius, it does come from a lack of options. You're campaigning as a super middleweight now. You have to fight somebody. You're not getting any younger. For David, it's the lesser of two evils. You know, Demetrius is a high-risk, low-reward guy, and so is David Morrell, but Demetrius isn't a puncher. David Morrell is. See the angling? It's a good fight, and we'll talk more about it once the fight is officially announced. Finally, in men's heavyweight news, Frank Warren is still carrying on about the Fury vs. Ngannou exhibition, event, whatever it is, saying that it's massive and it will break box office records. Though, whenever you ask somebody about this show, about this event, you usually get the same answer, that it's a pointless endeavor, a pointless excursion, and that both athletes should be doing other things. That Fury should be fighting Usyk and that Ngannou should be fighting John Bones Jones. This is the biggest event I've ever been involved with, Warren explained to William Hill. You've got the lineal champion and the number one heavyweight in the UFC. The guy from the UFC has decided he wants to fight. I haven't got a problem with that. It's a massive, massive event, the biggest event out there that will break box office records. We'll see about that. What I'm seeing a lot of in the boxing community, specific to boxing and the boxing fan, is that there's not a lot of enthusiasm about this and people are just calling it what it is, a brazen cash grab in place of what could be and should be the undisputed heavyweight title fight. Most are not convinced that Fury was earnestly trying to get in the ring with Usyk. That it was never his intention to get into the ring with Usyk and that all this time, this is what he was planning because immediately after 
after the Dillian White fight over a year ago, he brought in Ganu in the ring. This is what he was planning, and everything that we've seen in between the end of that fight and where we are now has been a smokescreen. I believe it. One of the problems we had with fighters before pay-per-view is they would have to go to Las Vegas. Do you know why? why? Because why? they get a psych why? fee from a casino before you start, Warren said. Uh... When I launched a pay-per-view fight with Mike Tyson and Frank Brunio, the first show on Sky, that was a game changer because then we could start doing loads of shows over here with Showtime, a place where we launched a lot of fighters' careers. Warren detailing why Saudi Arabia could eventually become a very big rival to Las Vegas when it comes to securing high-profile pay-per-view events, and it seems that they're on track to become just that. They're willing to spend boatloads of cash to host certain fights. With Saudi, this is a slightly similar situation. Where we are now, we're doing an event out there and we are opening up the Riyadh Festival, which is huge. Saudi Arabia has all this criticism about it, but they are out here saying, this is our country. Is it any different than when Roman Abramovich came to Chelsea or when the same thing happened to Manchester City? Frank Warren has maintained that they never received anything concrete, anything official for what was supposed to be the Usyk fight. And what seems to poke a lot of holes in Frank Warren's story. Remember, Fury versus Usyk was supposed to happen on the same card as Wilder versus AJ. And Wilder versus AJ is on track to go down. You ask both sides of it, Team Wilder, Team AJ. And that fight was supposed to go down on the same show, same night, as Fury versus Usyk. So this idea that the Saudis weren't serious about doing that fight with Fury and Usyk or that the money wasn't real. That the wheels weren't in motion. Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua do end up fighting that pokes serious holes in Frank's story. Frank's account of events looks more like as soon as Tyson Fury found an alternative to an Usyk fight that everybody was expecting him to have, that as soon as he found an alternative, he took it, even if it meant fighting in a circus fight with a non boxer. Disgraceful. Shameless. And you're hearing Frank carrying on about how big this is going to be, how it's going to break records. I question what's going to drum up more business, what's going to bring in more pay-per-view buys, the fight between Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder, or this excursion, this circus fight between Fury and Ngannou. I'm just asking. Because I don't know for sure. What I do know is that when Francis Ngannou was still with Dana White's UFC, he wasn't the biggest draw. He wasn't their top-selling guy. Comes to Fury, it's the same deal. While he makes great money, he's not the biggest draw in the sport of boxing. He's not saying that the pay-per-view you won't do nothing, that they won't be able to drum up some business, but I do question as to whether or not this event will be as big as Frank says it is. Whether or not this event will end up selling more than the Joshua versus Wilder fight, because if it doesn't... Francis Ngannou, for all his ability, he didn't have the biggest following in the UFC. The benefit for Fury is somebody's guaranteeing him a boatload of cash for a fight that doesn't involve very many risks. Not many risks to an experienced Boxer. So he probably doesn't care what it does. Gary doesn't, but perhaps Frank might, given all the promises that he's making that this is going to be so fucking big, so massive, it's going to break all these records. We'll see what it does and what it don't do. How big it is or how big it ain't. I myself don't feel so inclined to purchase it. Not really. An MMA fighter, even an MMA champion, has about as much place in a boxing ring as a basketball player does. Same level of experience. And I'm supposed to fork over $80 to see that?